Okay, this evening we'll be in Jeremiah 33 and 34, a couple of short chapters, uh, but uh, again, uh, important chapters as the Word of God is always important. The first chapter we're going to look at uh, is a continuation of last week's chapter about the restoring of Israel to the land, so it's, it's kind of a, a little bit of a repeat, so we'll kind of go through it rather quickly. And then the second chapter is when uh, Jeremiah's in prison and he has to trust the Lord. So I, I, I theme this in God we trust because the nation Israel has to trust God that he has given them a promise and he restore them. And then also in God I trust because uh, Jeremiah's in prison and he has to trust God that there's a purpose for him being in prison and he would use him. And then I thought about this when, when we really think about it as, as a nation and as a people, the only way that we can be blessed and successful is, is, is when our nation trusts in God and when the people trust in God. If you have one or the other out of line, then you have a struggle, you have a battle that is going on and that's what we see happening today in our nation and with the people we not only have a government that's out of line but we have a people that's also out of line and so we don't longer have a government that was established by our founding fathers on christianity the bibles the scriptures um and so forth but we have a government that is secular and it's governed by what they say is truth and truth to them is based upon the culture and what the people decide is truth and where the, the whim is moving to in one direction or another. And that's why there's such a battle with same-sex marriage, with abortion, with prayer in school and so forth. Because you have people that say, hey, I don't believe in God. I don't believe there is a God. I think that's a fairy tale. And so why should I send my kids to school uh, when they're praying? I don't want my kids praying. So take that out of school. Well, they've won. Um, I don't believe that... Uh, that, that an embryo is a human being and so let, let's have the right to abort that embryo and so they won you know and, and we just continue to see that secularism without a god and then you have the side that that believes in god and trust in god and believes that this is the word of god and it's good for us to live by it every word of it uh, for our lives because it brings prosperity and it brings basically god on our side he's working with us and for us uh, and you can't have a better partner than that, than God himself who created the heavens and the earth. And so if you can believe that first verse in Genesis, then you can believe everything else, that God created everything. And, and this side says that prayer is important because it connects us to God, and God's the one that, uh, that, that does things for us, that blesses us, that brings prosperity and rain and, and, and what we need to survive as a nation and as a people. And so there's this battle. And so if we have a nation that trusts in God and we have a people that trust in God, then we have a blessed society. We have a blessed United States. But unfortunately, we don't have that today. It would be wonderful to get back to that. It'd be wonderful if every Christian man and woman would vote when voting time came around and they would vote on morality, on truth, and not on secularism, not on popularism. I love the Fox News uh, once in a while, I don't know the guy's name, he'll go around and he'll ask questions, political questions. You know, um, I, the last one that I saw was kind of hilarious and ridiculous at the same time because they were asking women, are you vote why are you voting for Hillary Clinton? Because she's a woman? And he's like, yes, because she's a woman. And, and that's the only reason? Well, yeah, that's a good reason to vote for her because she's a woman. You know, and so the whole reason for them voting is not her political stance, not her foreign affairs, not her you know, stance on abortion, not her stance on morals. It's just that she's a woman. We want to get a woman up there because we've never had a woman up there. That's not a good reason. That's not a good reason at all. We've never had a serial killer up there either. Let's just put him up there. You know, it doesn't make any sense. Or a pedophile, let's put him up there. You know, but this is our society. that They don't even think anymore. And I blame that on the school system because they don't want you to think. Uh, they want you to be dumb. They don't want you to educate yourself. They don't want you reading the Word of God and, and become smarter than they are in a sense because the Bible does tell us that when we have God's wisdom, we're smarter than the wisest man in the whole earth because it's God's wisdom. It's His truth and His truth surpasses uh, any worldly truth whatsoever. Any psychologist, uh, psychiatric truth at all it's it, it all surpasses all of that because that whole study of human behavior and so forth god has given us what we need to live in a, as godly people and as a godly nation right here in the word and so if we trust in god as a nation trust in god ourselves then we will prosper now that doesn't 
mean that, I don't mean to say that if we don't personally trust in God that God can't bless us because he can. So if you trust in God, even if the nations don't trust in God, God can still bless you because you are a, a light and he will use that little light to light the world. And all it takes is for one of us to be revived and to be passionately moved by the Spirit of God for the Lord to begin to do a new work. And we're praying for that. So in these passages, they con- contain several promises concerning the, the restoration of, of Israel, of Judea and Jerusalem, and describing of the rebuilding of Jerusalem, not just in 1948, but also in the millennium years we've been uh, sharing these last few weeks. So let's go ahead and read <clears throat> chapter 33, verses 1 through 26, basically is God's promise to Israel here and how he's going to restore them. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time, Well, he was still shut up in the courts of the prison, saying, Thus says the Lord who made it and the Lord who formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Now, I I really like those words. Call to me. and I think that's God's uh, calling to all of us is that we would all come and call to him on a regular basis to have prayer in the morning to have it in the evening and to have it at all times where we're calling on the lord to to help us to guide us and to lead us i think of many times that our the 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 patriarchs called on the lord abraham and david and moses as they called on the lord as the children of israel were in the wilderness and they needed water and they called on the lord and as they needed food they called on the lord and the lord would always answer them in great and mighty ways and i believe god is still doing that today the gifts have not ceased for today and if we call on him and the word calling um gives us a sense of continually calling on him, continually seeking him, continually asking him. And I believe that he will answer us in mighty ways, just as he did the children of Israel. For thus says the Lord, verse four, the God of Israel concerning the house of this city and the houses of the kings of Judah, which have been pulled down to fortify against the siege mount and the sword. Now, this is a picture of their pride. This is a picture of them trusting and having faith in their own strength and in their own abilities. When you read the little book of Obadiah, it's an interesting little book, what, 24, 25 verses? Small little book, easy reading. I I encourage you to read it tonight. It's in the Old Testament there. And it's a neat book because the people at that time were living in the cliffs of the rocks. They were like hiding in places and they thought, they'll never get us, you know? They'll never conquer us and so forth. And God's like, you know, I don't think so. I mean, I'm God. I created the cliffs and the rocks, you know, and, and so forth. And so you can't hide from, from me. You, you can't run from me because I know where you're at. And, and this is kind of the same thing. They would, they would build their cities and they would put their cities and their houses in the rocks, uh, into the side of hills and so forth. And they thought that that was going to prepare them. But what God is saying here is they're going to tear those houses down and they're going to use those houses to fortify uh, their um, siege against you and just mount your rubbish and your homes and all that so that they uh, can come in and take you into bondage. So doesn't say much for pride or our will or our ways uh, seem to always fail. I think our country's learning that right now, right? The more we see what's going on, like in Baltimore, something like that. Now, yeah, <clears throat> you know, it was sad that that individual died because of uh, the beating and so forth. But for the people to rebel like that, instead of thinking about it and, and taking the proper course of action against it, they just, like animals, begin to react and just cause havoc. And now everyone's coming out and they're giving you, giving us the reasons. You know, I heard, read one article that it's because they're allowing, it's a, this, the place that allows same-sex marriage. And that's the reason for all of this happening because of this sin and so forth. Then another group saying, well, it's not that, it's because it's a liberal state. You know, and so everybody's on welfare, everybody's taking handouts and, and, and so forth. And so the people are being uh, oppressed in a sense. And it's, it's because the women are, are being separated from the men 
uh, because the government's taking care of the women. And so they're, they're pregnant, they have kids, but they have no husbands. And, and they want it that way because they want the men out of the picture and it's causing all of this frustration. And that's, that's socialism and that's psychiatry, how we try to figure out the mind and how people work and how they think and, and so forth. And, and you, know, you can agree to a certain extent that, that some of those things are, are important to look at. And that, that we do have certain behavioral patterns as human beings, you know. And one of the patterns is that we're prone to sin. You know, that's one of the patterns. And that seems to be one thing they don't look at, is that we're human beings and we have a sinful nature. And, and if we can lack, act like animals, and, and I even read one article that the mayor says, just leave them alone, let them act like that. You know, just destroy everything. Let them destroy everything so they get their frustration out and so forth, you know, and that's what happens is, okay, I've got the okay, I'm not going to get in trouble, boom, I'll act like an animal, and that's just crazy, uh, we live in a society that just, uh, uh, it's not working, our system is not working, we need to get back to God's system, and then we can bring it even, bring it home to ourselves, <clears throat> I read another uh, article about uh, raising children, and the article was was basically stating why are why are children staying in church? Three reasons. One reason is that their parents clearly spoke to them the gospel. <clears throat> they clearly spoke to them the gospel. The other reason is that the kids understood that you are to go to church not for entertainment, but to serve God. And then the other reason, I forgot. <laughs> but let me tell you, when I read that article, I'm like, right on, because that's exactly what I did. I shared the gospel clearly with my boys. Not only did I share it clearly, but I shared it forcefully. And when they did things, and we're so fearful to do this at times, because, um, <clears throat> and I understand why, there were times when they would sin or they would do things wrong and I would, I would call them on it and say, is that how a Christian acts? If you call yourself a Christian, why are you acting like that? And I would challenge them because a Christian will not continue to act in that manner. And they're just you know, listening to me, but it, it was embedded in them what a Christian really is, what is light and what is dark. And it was clear. And so they understood it completely. And then I took them to church with me. It, it wasn't just me going to church or Virginia going to church. We were going to serve. We're not there to be entertained. We're not there for, for ourselves. We're there to serve others. That's what God has called us to do. And so when I started, <clears throat> they asked us to clean the toilets, and that's what we did. So me and the boys would go to church and we would clean the toilets. We would vacuum, we would dust, we'd put things in order every, I think it was Saturdays, I think it was, if I remember correctly, because it was before church. And so we went there to serve. If the doors were open and they were having a cleanup work party, we were there. They had a men's breakfast, my boys were with me. Sometimes they were the only young, young lads there, but they were with me. And so I embedded in them, it's not about entertainment. It's about being a servant. Jesus said... I did not come to be served, but to serve. So there's, there's scriptural uh, evidence for that. And Jesus was trying to tell the disciples the same thing as they were coming down the Mount of Transfiguration. And they were arguing who's the greatest in the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, the least of you is the greatest. The one who serves others is the greatest. The one who gives of themselves is the greatest. And, and so those are the things that really I really believe taught my boys that, that Christianity is an important thing and that they really need to believe it and not just say it. You know, and I just kind of challenged my grandson tonight, maybe because I had that article. I said, why are you here tonight? He goes, it's Wednesday. Well, you're here because it's Wednesday? Well, that's a good reason to be here because it's Wednesday. He goes, no, it's church. Well, church, there's religious people who go to church all day long. Why are you here? He's like, to worship Jesus? <laughs> you know? There you go. That's why you're here. To worship Jesus, you know? We're here, we're here to, to honor Him. That's a word we lost, to honor Him. No matter how we feel, just because we need to honor Him for who He is, honoring Jesus. How, how's it working with some of us, you know? In our society, and our children, and so forth. Not very good, because we're not using biblical principles. It's sad when I see parents, and they're 
walking away or they're living contrary to scriptures and I, I ask myself, do they realize what they're really teaching their children? Do they realize it's not just affecting them, but they're being selfish and saying, I have a life and I get to live it without church. And I don't have to be bothered with the burden and so forth. But what they're telling their children who will grow up and say, I don't have to go to church because I remember that one time or those times when they didn't go to church. That's what bothers me is that we're being examples to them and we're being bad examples to our children. And, we're, and they're going to grow up just the, the way that they see us growing up not working we need to get back to biblical principles <clears throat> and so they're they're trying to hide in the cliffs of the rocks and so forth and they came to fight with the chaldeans verse 5 but only to fill their places with the dead bodies of men who will whom i will slay in my anger and my fury all for whose wickedness i have hidden my face from this city Behold, I will bring it health and healing. I will heal them and reveal to them the abundance of peace and truth. So at one point, you know, the bondage and the captivity, but then you really see God's heart. It's about restoring them. It's about healing them and bringing them peace. And so as a nation, we need some horrific things to happen, like Nepal, to wake us up. You know, there's a situation, 4,000 people are dead. You see the pictures of babies covered with, with dust and so forth. And it makes you realize what is really important. Trusting in God is more important than anything because a lot of people died without God. Not, that, not only did they go through a horrific thing, but they're now going to go through an eternally horrific thing without God. And so the gospel, knowing Jesus Christ personally, so important for those people. And we need to get back to those basic things. Uh, it wasn't about work. You know, I talked a couple of weeks ago about how we think that we're needing to work because we need to provide and so forth. But God provides. How quickly? Poof, he just said, no, none of you are working. 4,000, boom, out of jobs that quick. It's God who protects. It's God who, who uh, encompasses his people and so forth. It's not us. And we need God more in our lives than ever before. And we need to honor him. So his heart, it really is to bring us healing and peace. And it's always through his truth. And I will cause the captivities of Judah and the captivities of Israel to turn. And will rebuild those places as at first. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned and by which they have transgressed against me. Uh, restoration right there. First John 1 John 1.9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. If we humble ourselves before the Lord, he'll lift us up. He, he wants to forgive iniquities. That's his heart. He doesn't, he doesn't hold grudges, but he'll allow you to go through things so that you come to him in confession. I was playing around with, um, who was it? Uh, oh, your little girl. She she came in, she went like this to me. I'm like, ow, I was like, that hurt. She was, oh, oh, I'm going to go tell your mommy. No, 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 don't do that. And she was like, no, 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 you're okay, you're okay. I'm like, all right, I feel better, I feel better. But I, I wanted to get a word from her. <clears throat> and so I'm like, no, no, it still hurts. And she goes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you, oh, you're you're forgiven, you know, you're forgiven. God does that to us, right? He allows us to go through things so that we humble ourselves and say, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. You know, I did something I shouldn't have done, you know, and I apologize for that. And he says, okay. We're back at the prodigal son. He opens his arms to the prodigal son and says, come back. You know, tells the religious brother, you know, hey, go prepare a huge feast because your brother's back. That's how God is. Then it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all nations of the earth who shall hear all the good that I do to them. They shall hear, <clears throat> they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity that I provide for it. Thus says the Lord again, there shall be heard in, the, in this place of which you say is a, is, it is desolate without man and without beast in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate without man and without inhabitants and without beast. The voice of joy, 
And the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the voice of those who will say, praise the Lord of hosts for the Lord is good for his mercies endures forever. And of those whom will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord for I will cause the captives of the land to return as at the first says the Lord. Hallelujah, that's the way it should be at all times. Now, that's not going to happen till the millennium. You know, even today, God is prospering, God is blessing, He's protecting them, but there's still much more that God's going to do with Israel. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in this place which is desolate without a man and without beast, and in all its cities, there shall again be a dwelling place of shepherds, causing their flocks to lie down. In the cities of the mountains, in the cities of the lowlands, in the cities of the south, in the land of Benjamin, in the places around Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah. The flock shall again pass under the hands of him who counts them, saith the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. <clears throat> we talked last week, remember, about God's promises. And we can believe Him when He promises us those things. In those days and at that time, I will cause you or cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. And that's a prophetic word of Jesus Christ. In those days and at that time, he's going to raise up Jesus Christ as that branch of righteousness. Jesus is righteous. He's the only one that is righteous. He is without sin. The Bible is clear that he became sin for us. And so he is righteous. We need him in our lives. And in those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she will be called. The Lord our righteousness. We find that uh, this is uh, also written back in Jeremiah 23, verse 6, where he says, Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. And so the Lord is our righteousness. Uh, it's been imputed to us. He has given us his righteousness so that when we stand before God, God sees his righteousness and not our own righteousness. Do we understand that, <clears throat> the imputed righteousness of God? Do we understand that we cannot stand before God on our own righteousness? If you believe that there is a God or, or at least a creator of some sort, I, mean, I hope you believe that. You look around at, 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 at this world and you have, to, you have to ask yourself, did this world evolve or did someone create it? <clears throat> you have to say someone created it. It's very difficult to say. It takes a lot of faith to say it evolved into what it is. There, there's too many intricate parts to it to say that it just evolved into this situation. Too many cells, too many, uh, too many parts within a cell itself where there are billions and billions cities. Uh, in one cell, they say that there's like New York City within a cell constantly working and building and doing things just to keep the body where it's at. And that's just one little cell. And to say that evolved into that billions and billions of years... You know, it's almost ridiculous. We know that the Bible says that no God created the heavens and the earth. If, if you were to get, take an individual that had the gift of, of painting and you took a canvas and he painted this beautiful Mona Lisa on there, how many would say, well, that just kind of evolved into a Mona Lisa? The canvas just kind of put itself together and, and paint just threw itself on there and this beautiful picture. And it, just, it took billions and billions and billions and billions of years, but eventually it happened. You know, it's ridiculous to think that. Or an automobile. You know, have an automobile. Well, that just evolved and just put itself together and so forth. It's ridiculous to say that. And we know that. And you look at the whole world, you go to, to, to Bishop and to the Sierras, and you look at the mountain ranges and the waters, and you go, how could this just evolve? And even the whole flood, if you just fly over Arizona and the, and the Grand Canyon, and you really look at it, you can see the highs and the lows, that there was a flood. Just the way the water is flowing and in different directions, high spots and low spots, you know, and you see that the water had to be so much higher to create those. And ponds and so forth that eventually dried up. And you look, and that was created by God. <clears throat> no, He is the Lord, our righteousness. It, it's Him. Uh, he tested us in the garden and we failed. We couldn't even keep the one command to not eat of that fruit. And we failed Him. And so we brought sin into the world. 
And because the sin is in the world, God created a plan, and that is that he would send his son to take our place, to be our righteousness. So it was his blood, the blood of Jesus that was poured on us. He was a sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they would take sacrifices. And when a person sinned or transgressed against God's law, they would bring a lamb and they would sacrifice it so that they could be forgiven. So uh, was, it, was it their works or was it the lamb that forgave them? It was God who forgave them, but it was because of the lamb's blood that was shed. And it was a type of, it was a type of what was going to come in Jesus Christ. And if a nation sinned, if a tribe sinned, then they would take a lamb and the priest would lay his hand on the lamb and then they would, um, I'm sorry, the goat, and then they would pray over it and, and they would confess their sins and they let it go. And, and it would no longer be seen and then God would forgive them all, signifying that everything's laid on that goat and he's out into the wilderness as far as the east is from the west. So it's God's righteousness that we need, not our own. So we can not depend on not just a little bit of our righteousness, not a little bit at all. It's all on him and him alone. Doesn't devalue us at all. If anything, it makes us worth even more that Christ would even die for us. That he would even die for us. Verse 17, For thus says the Lord David, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And Jesus is sitting there to this day right in the right hand of the Father. Nor shall the priests, the Levites, lack a man to offer burnt offerings before me, to kindle grain offerings, and to sacrifice continually the preeminence of God's covenant. Now this is interesting because <clears throat> if this is the millennium where Jesus will be that the Lord of righteousness forever, why are there still sacrifices going on there? Notice that there's a sacrifice missing there. There's no sin offering. Jesus was the sin offering. And so there's no need for a sin offering. This was more in a memorial, kind of like our communion, for us to realize what God has really done for us. And we're going to, in a sense, off being, bring offerings of burnt offerings and grain offerings and sacrifice offerings unto him for what he has done for us. And so we're, in a sense, going to take what we have and just give it right back to him. There's some, somewhere in Revelation where it talks about our crowns, we'll receive crowns, and we're going to cast the crowns right back to him because we know that we're not even worthy for his crown. But God does reward us, and I find that interesting, that he rewards us for what we do on earth, you know, for the things that we um, partake of, in a sense, and serve with others. We don't hear that too often. You know, as a church... We have we have this 503c nonprofit status. You know, we're part of the government system. Uh, we're looked at as a a service in a sense, and and volunteers and and so forth. But it is way beyond even that when we think about it. And so when we go to church, we get this idea that I'm volunteering. No, you're not volunteering. We get this idea that I'm giving of my time to church and, and they should be grateful that I'm even here and, and, and then I'm supporting them at the same time. But see, we got the wrong idea. First of all, you get to serve here. <laughs> you get to serve the Lord. Well, that's a privilege. That is, not, that is not something you do. That is something that God gives you, the privilege to serve him. It really is. Because if uh, he did not come into our lives, you know, we would not be thinking about him or serving him so it is a privilege to serve in his kingdom we're actually in a kingdom and we're serving in the kingdom and in this kingdom we are being rewarded now again another observation in in our world is we work and we work with our hands and we perform you know we do certain tasks and so we expect to be paid for that right we want to be paid for that so then when you go to church you you work and you're doing things and so you expect something for that and what is it? Usually it's praise because you know you're not going to get anything monetarily. So it's usually praise or, or some sort of thank you and, you know, and so forth. And so people expect that. But there's greater rewards that we forget about. We're in a kingdom. And God is storing up treasures for us in heaven. And so the things we do here on earth, whether it's preaching the gospel, evangelizing, cleaning, you know, in the children's ministry, just whatever it is in the kingdom of God, God is sending rewards up. You are getting paid. It's kind of like Social Security. You never see it until you retire. 
you know and, and so when you get to heaven you're going to see it and you're going to see how much you have and he doesn't send you a statement that says oh right now you've got like 800 dollars a month if you retire and it's 862 <laughs> you know but if you wait till 70 it may go up to 1200 God doesn't do that. It's greater. He, he's putting it in the, in the vault. And he says, I've created mansions for you. But we forget that. We want it now. We want to see it now. And if we're not appreciated, then forget it. Well, you just lost it. Because what was the motive? What was the motive? And so people don't even serve at all. They don't even participate at all. Because they don't have that observation that this is a kingdom. And what we do in the kingdom is important. And whether it's just supporting it, and you may be a person that's well off and you're able to support the work, and that's a good thing too because that's part of working in the kingdom. So what are you sending up to heaven? What what are you going to offer in those times? Because we're offering all the time to him. But no sin offering because Jesus took care of that. He was the ultimate sin offering. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and in my covenant with the night so that there will not be day and night in their seasons. Then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne. And with the Levites, the priests, my ministers, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered nor the sand of the sea measures, so will I multiply the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Have you not considered what these people have spoken, saying, The two families which the Lord has chosen, he has also cast them off. And he's talking about Israel there in Judea. Thus they have despised my people, as if they should no more be a nation before them. Referring to also the surrounding nations who have a hatred for Israel and kind of laughing and saying aha see your God doesn't really really love you thus says the Lord if my covenant is not with day and night and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth then I will cast away the descendants of Jacob and David my servant so that I will not take any of his descendants to be rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> Those are our founding fathers in Christianity. For I will cause their cap- captives to return and will have mercy on them. So Israel and Judah are not rejected, are not forgotten. God will restore them just as he said. Now we come to chapter 34 which starts a new section. <clears throat> Jeremiah is basically going to tell uh, King Zedekiah uh, his fate here in verses 1 through 7. The word of the Lord, or the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his armies, all the kingdoms of the earth, under dominion, and all the people fought against Jerusalem and all of its cities. Not good for Israel. Uh, in other words, Nebuchadnezzar's invasion of Judea, including the siege of Jerusalem, is on its way at this point. Remember, Jeremiah doesn't go through a chronological move here. He just jumps around from different places, going back and then going forward and so forth. So it's hard to follow where is he's at. So right now we're at where, where Nebuchadnezzar is coming up against Jerusalem. So, so thus says the Lord, of, Lord, the God of Israel, verse 2, Go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and tell him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from his hand. Now judgment is coming on him. But shall surely be taken and delivered into his hands. Your eyes shall shall see the eyes of the king of Babylon. He shall speak with, with you face to face and you shall go to Babylon. So Zedekiah is brought to Nebuchadnezzar. Then he's forced to, to watch the execution of his sons. And then he's blinded at this point. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus says the Lord concerning you, you shall not die by the sword, you shall die in peace, as in the ceremonies of your fathers, the former kings who were before you. So they shall burn incense for you and lament for you, says, saying, Ah, at last, Lord, for I have pronounced the word, says the Lord. So basically he would receive a funeral appropriate for the status of a, of a king of Judah. Then Jeremiah the prophet spoke all these words to Zedekiah, king of Judah and Jerusalem. 
How do you think he felt about that? <laughs> Probably not too good. That's why he's in prison in the first place, right? When the king of Babylon's army fought against Jerusalem and all the cities of Judah that were left against Lachish and Azedkai, for only these four to five cities remained of the cities of Judah. Now, these were important cities. Uh, there were border fortresses in the hills of Judah and south of Jerusalem, so they were kind of... Uh, helping in the battle against them as they were being attacked by Jerusalem. Now, all of a sudden, he switches over to slaves. And one of the reasons that, that God is judging the nation Israel and Judah is because they wouldn't uh, allow the land to rest. you remember that? Uh, they had um, used it up. They were supposed to allow it to rest every seventh years. For, t for ten, what, ten years or so, they did not not 10 years, 70 years, they did not let it rest. And so God judged them and, and he's going to let the land rest for 70 years while they were in captivity. But another thing they, they did was that they wouldn't allow the slaves to return home. And so uh, Jeremiah is saying, you need to do that. And especially now, you need to set those things in order. So they were keeping the slaves, uh, which tells us that they were materialistic, right? It was about money. It's all about money. Everything's about money. Where can I make money? The government's uh, not being honest with us. They need money. And we're tired of hearing taxes, so what do they do? Well, we're not get, raising taxes, but there's fees now. So there's fees. So we're going to find a lot more fees, not taxes, but fees that are, that are coming up. Uh, our bank here for the church, uh, banks with other banks because it's a credit union and so we get the privilege of going to these other places and depositing our monies but it's about money and so now there's a fee to deposit and every time you deposit you know the bank wants five dollars for that deposit and that was something we weren't paying before so it's all about how can we make money well where can we make money well, we're offering a service here and they're actually depositing it why aren't we charging them for that <laughs> you know it's just all about money and so forth in other banks, it's not necessarily a, a, a deposit fee, but then it's a check transaction fee. So it's per check, and they may charge you five cents per check or twelve cents per check. We have a, a system, and you know, and some of it's convenient, some of it isn't, and that's what it's about. And you got to weigh that on both sides and so forth. But it's all about money, and, and we need to be careful that we don't make it all about money in our own personal lives. It's more blessed to give than to receive this is the word that came to jeremiah from the lord after king zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people who were at jerusalem to proclaim liberty to them that every man should set free his male and female slave a hebrew man or woman that no one should keep a jewish brother in bondage so there was a law at this time if you could not afford to live you could sell a child or yourself, usually yourself, to someone. In a sense, you were hiring yourself out. You were leasing yourself out to them. And they would pay you an amount, and it would be for seven years. So either you'd work it off, or at the end of seven years, it would be forgiven, and you'd go back to your, to your home. That's the way it was supposed to work. Well, again, like if you think back to the days of, of slavery here in America, and even uh, owning homes and, and so for the earlier part, uh, or working for someone else, uh, even today they probably have it. You want a, your U U.S. citizenship, you have to work uh, off the fee f for getting you in here. And of course, you never work off that fee, and you're working forever because if you break something, oh, you just added to your fee. You know, if you violate something, oh, you just added more to your fee. You know, and, and if you were in the slavery business, you know, it was about owning you for the rest of your life and then your children's children's children and so forth and so they were taking advantage of that and they were utilizing it for their selfish reasons so th originally they were to give them the money take their services and at the end of some years they were off or if they paid their debt off or even if a brother came along a relative and said hey i want to pay their debts you know the lord bless us this year let's just pay it off and then they get to return home also and set things back in order there so verse 10 now when all the prince and all the people who had entered into the covenant heard that everyone should 
set free his male and female slaves that no one should keep them in bondage anymore. They obeyed and let them go. But afterwards they changed their minds and made a male and made the male and female slaves return whom they had set free and brought them into subjection as male and female slaves. What happened here was, was there was a time where where they were being attacked, where all of a sudden there was some, some uh, release, a time where they just backed off and they thought, oh, so, so we're being victorious. Let's get those slaves back. You know, forget about letting them go. And, and they asked them to come back or they forced them to come back. And so um, that was something they shouldn't have done. Therefore, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the, in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, saying, at the end of seven years, let every man set free his Hebrew brother who has been sold to him. And when he has served you six years, you shall let him go free from you. But your fathers did not obey me nor incline their ear. Then you recently turned and did what was right in my sight. Every man proclaimed liberty to his neighbor, and you made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name. Now, how did they make that covenant? Usually they would take an animal and they would uh, cut it in half. And then they would walk through the animal and it would signify a covenant. Abraham did that, if you remember, when God made a covenant with Abraham. And, and, and they cut the animal in half and Abraham and God were to walk through uh, that animal between it and signifying that they both would keep their part. So here they were to keep their part. They walked through with it with the Lord. They made an agreement with the individual or the family. Okay, seven, six years, we'll let you go. You're free to go home. We walk through the animal. It's a covenant. It's set. It's sealed. It's done. Of course, they still owed money, so they didn't do it. Now with Abraham, what was interesting, and I like that story, again, God's righteousness, we find that God put Abraham to sleep. And then when Abraham woke up, he saw uh, a burnt mark walking right through the animal. And it was God who would keep the covenant because Abraham couldn't keep it. So it's again, it's about God keeping it and not us. But when you make agreements with men to men, <laughs> they don't always uh, keep their promises, right? There used to be a day where you could shake a hand and you keep your promise. Can't do that anymore. Let me see it in writing. Right, it's just amazing. I still think that people are being truthful and they're going to keep their promise, but they don't. And you try to get their names, the times you called, and you record everything and you know the best you can, and it's because you know they're going to rip you off or they're not going to keep their promise. Your word should mean a lot. It should mean a lot, not just to you, but, but to others too, and it brings honor to the Lord. Verse, uh, I think we read 15, yeah, 16. Then you turned around and profaned my name, and every one of you brought back his male and female slave, whom you had set at liberty, at their pleasure, and brought them back into subjection to be your male and female slave. Therefore, thus says the Lord, you have not obeyed me in this proclaiming liberty. Every one to his brother and every one to his neighbor, behold, I proclaim liberty to you, says the Lord, to the sword, to pestilence, and to famine. And I will deliver you to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth. I find that interesting because I think that in a sense, as a nation, we've made a covenant with the Lord. In the beginning, we had this relationship with God. Our constitution is based on um, scriptures. Uh, the schools that, that started out in early part of our nation were all based upon scriptures. It was about teaching and reading the Bible. What they call it, the pri prim? The prim? There's a book called the prim. Um, Richard would probably know more about it. Prim something. Prim, uh, I can't get it. But it's an earlier book, and it's actually all scriptural. And it was the book they used in school for years and years and years. And they have copies of these things. But because we have broken the covenant, it just seems like our nation, which is now secular, and now we're suffering the repercussions, you know, of, of breaking that, that covenant, we find ourselves in pestilence and famines and droughts, troubles, earthquakes, you know, volcanoes erupting, tsunamis, 
you know, diseases, you know, all these things that are happening around us today. And I think that's, that's part of, of breaking our relationship with God. That hell just gets let loose upon us. And I will, and, and we should think about that for ourselves personally too, our relationship and our covenant with God and where we're walking with Him. And are we walking according to the word of the Lord? And if we're not, we need to get that right because you don't know what will happen. What will God allow into those relationships if you're not walking according to his word? I think we suffer more than not because of the things that we do or the things that we say we do or don't do. And I will give them, give the men who have transgressed my covenant who have not performed the word of the covenant which they made before me when they cut off, cut the half calf in two and pass between its parts. So there's the covenant there. The prince of Judah, the prince of uh, Jerusalem, the eunuch, the priests, and all the people of the land who pass between the two parts of the calves. And I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life. Their dead bodies shall be for meat, for the birds of the heavens, and for the beasts of the earth. And I will give Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes into the hands of their enemies, into the hands of those who seek their life, and into the hands of the king of Babylon's army, which has gone back from you. Behold, I will command, saith the Lord, and cause them to return to this city. They will fight against it and take it and burn it with fire. And I will make the cities of Judah, a desolation without inhabitants. And so he did. And that closes the chapter. Now he did that <clears throat> with Babylon. And Israel was scattered. The people that stayed back in Judah and then scattered into Egypt and also went into the Babylon. And 70 years later, 70 years later, they returned to the land, but they were yet still scattered. And then we find Jesus coming and entering into Jerusalem, as promised by Zacharias 9.9, on a donkey. And then he's crucified upon a cross. And because of the hardness of the hearts of Israel, God would judge them by destroying the temple once again. And so in AD 70, Titus came in and he killed a lot of Jews. And once again, they scattered throughout the world. And the temple was destroyed completely. And to this day, the temple is still not rebuilt. We're going to see it rebuilt again. And they're getting pretty close. The Temple Mount Institute has plans. They have the clothing. They have the red heifer. Uh, they've already raised them. They're, they're ready to go. They know who the Levites are. Everything's in order. They're just waiting for the temple to be rebuilt. I've seen some of the, uh, what would you call it, the models of the temple itself. Some say, well, there's a Dome of the Rock there. Well, now they're saying that the, there, there is a Gentile court and where the Dome of the Rock is could have been where the Gentile court was and so the temple was over more. And so that would mean that they would reside together there and that wouldn't be a problem for the temple being built. But once again, that temple is going to be, uh, at least there's going to be an attempt to destroy it by the Antichrist who will enter in that temple and he will make a covenant with Israel and of peace for three and a half years but then he will enter the temple and he will slaughter a pig to defy the temple and cause the abomination of desolation and he will sit on the throne and he will proclaim himself to be God and that is Satan's role right just like in Isaiah said I will sit upon a throne I will be just as high as you Lord because he wants that worship. So God is not done with the children of Israel. There's a lot of work to still be done with them. And it is not about the United States. <clears throat> it is about Israel and what's going on with Israel today. We need to pray for Israel. We need to pray for the church in the world today, which is all over the world, the true believers in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> well, what do you mean by that? Aren't we all true believers? Not really. The true believer is one who has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, who has the Holy Spirit. They are new creatures. 
Their hunger is for God and not for self. Their desire is for Israel. Their desire is for righteousness. Uh, Their hatred, and, and when I say hatred, their hatred of sin, not of people, because we should love people. We should love those people in Baltimore. How sad that that individual had to die. Uh, apparently, from what I read, it was from a spinal injury because he was beaten so badly. And that, that's excessive force, no matter what you call it. You know, and that's sad. And from what I'm reading, it seems like that was going, that was continual. And nothing against the police force. I'm not one of those guys. I, I love them. We need them. God has established the government for our protection. Very clear in Romans chapter 13. But these people need the Lord. And people are out there and trying to share the gospel with them. But it's the sin that we need to hate. It's it's the sin that is destroying this nation. And unfortunately, it's going to destroy this nation. And we're going to sit by and watch what will happen to Israel. And if Hillary gets in, it just continues to spiral down. So we need to be ready. We need to have a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, how do we do that? You know, there's no one set way. You can go to a crusade and walk up there. Or you can go to a church and raise your hand. But ultimately, it's going to be when you're ready in your heart to say, I need you, Lord Jesus, because I see I don't have anything. I can't do it on my own. I see that I'm a sinner, that I have flaws, and I'm not a righteous man. I'm just living throughout the day, and I just need you. And if you're real, just come into my life. That's what I did. I was in, I was in my company car. I was listening to the radio. You can get saved from the radio. You know, and, and I didn't know if it was real or not. I just said, God, if you're real, then save me right now. I believe in your son, Jesus Christ. I believe in the work that he did. And so I want that, and boy, because my heart was truthful and it was sincere, the Lord took it and whoosh, moved with it moved with it too many people want eternal life and they think it stops there i want you lord to give me eternal life but i'm going to live my own life still i'm going to do my own thing i don't want you in my life i just want eternal life and that's not uh, true christianity by far jesus said what repent he said repent turn from your sins agree with me that you're a sinful individual, and we'll we'll see that in a couple of weeks when we hit the Sermon on the Mount. Agree with me, and then turn from that and seek the kingdom of God and begin to to serve and and know Jesus. And and when you get saved, guys, you will have a desire for the Word of God. You will want to read it because you want to know who your Savior is. That's just, I think, natural. I think it's natural. When the first time I saw my wife, I fell in love with her. And so I wanted to know who she was. I just didn't stand by. I got to know who she was because I loved her. And I did whatever it took to get to know who she was, what classes she had, who were her friends, you know, where did she hang out, and I happened to walk by. I mean, there were times where she'd hang out in a certain area, and I w- she didn't even know me, and I'd walk by just to see her. And I go do something, I come walk by again, just, you know, walking by and so forth because I wanted to be with her. And the same is true with God. When, when you know him, you want to know him, not just in your heart, mind, body and soul and all your strength because he is our God and we're to honor him.